Hi, everyone, and welcome to another one of our USC Viterbi School of Engineering faculty roundtable sessions. Uh, this particular faculty roundtable session is with our Department of Astronautical Engineering. My name is Paul Ledesma. I'm the Executive Director of Undergraduate Admission, and I will be moderating today's discussion, but you won't hear a lot from me because we have three fantastic faculty members here. Actually, we should have a fourth one just come in on just a minute, but we're making sure we're, to get him on in just a second to represent the Astronautical Engineering Department. We're going to have each of them introduce themselves uh, in just a second here. I'm going to have you go with Gruntman, Reisman, and then Irwin in that particular order. So, Professor Gruntman. Thank you very much. Uh, good evening, good afternoon, good morning, wherever you are. I'm Mike Grundman. I'm a professor of astronautics, and uh, I'm a specialist in uh, space science, space technology, heliosphere, magnetosphere, instruments, uh, rockets, missiles, and all that. I am also in charge of the Master of Science program in the department. And uh, this is one of the largest in the country. And the later, if Paul uh, let me a couple minutes, I will explain why it is important because the so-called progressive degree program is a very important component now in the school. Many students take advantage of that. So I will talk about that. And um, yeah, and so, and I'm teaching uh, courses in uh, space systems, uh, satellites and in the rocketry and propulsion. Thank Back you. to you, Professor, Paul. Thank you, Professor Reisman. Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Professor Reisman, and uh, I teach courses here in our AST department related to human spaceflight, uh, different aspects of human spaceflight, and uh, do some research in the area of human AI teaming with regard to deep space habitats. And before I came to USC, I was a director of space operations at SpaceX. And prior to that, I was a NASA astronaut and flew two uh, missions, a long duration mission on the ISS and a short duration mission on Space Shuttle Atlantis up to the ISS. And uh, I'll just leave it at that for now. And uh, we'll talk more soon. Absolutely, thank you. Professor Irwin. Well, hi everybody, welcome. Uh, I'm Dan Irwin. I'm professor of astronautics. I'm, I'm uh, for better or worse, I'm the chair of this department. Um, I'm also heavily involved in the undergraduate program. I'm currently teaching the Introduction to Astronautics, which if you were to come here next year, you would be taking that course because it's the very first course in astronautics that you would take. Um, in the past, I've taught the, the rocket propulsion course. I've also taught in electric propulsion, plasmas, rarefied gas dynamics, um, and actually a few other courses. Uh, my research for some years was in hypersonics, rarefied gas dynamics, later in electric propulsion, electric spacecraft propulsion. Um, lately, it's been in autonomous vehicles and self-driving vehicles. All right, thank you. And uh, Professor Barnhart, apologies for the technical issues, but thanks, I'm glad you're here. No worries, thanks very much. Uh, pleasure to be here. Uh, happy to see everybody. Um, I'm a professor in the astronautics department. Uh, I actually teach uh, the senior capstone design course. So when you guys make it all the way through to the seniors, you'll probably see me. And I also teach one of the graduate courses uh, that Mike puts on for ground communications. We actually teach you guys how to track satellites and you're actually on the console. I'm also the director of something called the Space Engineering Research Center, um, where we're lucky enough to have actually built some uh, satellites and launched them. Uh, and then this year, we're actually sending up an experiment to Garrett's old stomping ground, which is actually going to be tested inside the ISS, which is pretty exciting for us. It's our first time up there. So welcome. Thanks. Fantastic. So for all of our guests, this is how today's event is going to work. Uh, I'm going to be moderating the discussion for about the first half of the, the the talk here with some specific questions that most of you have. If not, it's going to address a lot of things you're thinking about. And then towards the latter half of the session is when we're going to turn the conversation over to you. So for now, you cannot use any of the features uh, related to Q&A or anything else. But as we get a little bit halfway through, I'm going to turn on the Q&A feature, and that's where you'll be able to input your questions. So be thinking about the questions you want to ask, but be mindful of Sometimes the questions you want to ask, we may have already answered. So just be thinking about things you want to ask. I'm going to turn on the Q&A feature, which is the bottom section. You're going to be able to type in your questions. And then also as an audience, we're going to make this a democratic process. You're going to be able to upvote the questions that you want to see asked. So ask as many questions as you like, and then go in and upvote the ones that you want to get to the top. We'll get to as many questions as we possibly can in our remaining time. I guarantee we will not get to all of them, but I'm confident we'll get to 
the most important ones as we get through today's session. So for now, sit back, relax, and enjoy the talk, and then we'll get to your questions in a little bit. So my first question for our faculty members, and I'm sure you all are going to want to chime in with certain perspectives on this, but I'm going to direct this uh, for to, at the beginning to Professor Grutman. What the heck is astronautical engineering? Can you help our audience understand what astronautical engineering is with a couple points of context? One, high school students, you know, we, we don't really know. Maybe math and science is a background of ours. Uh, and we're, we've heard aerospace, we've heard mechanical, we've heard astronautical. What are the differences? Help us understand what this whole thing is all about. So obviously, physics and mathematics are very important. This is a foundation for any area of engineering. Uh, whatever you do in life, uh, you have to be well versed in that. Now, in the big field that people call aerospace, there are two main components. One is dealing with aeronautics, basically with airplanes, with the flows of fluids and all that. And then there's a space component that deals with building space vehicles, rockets, satellites, exploration, landing on the moon and doing things on the moon, robots, and all kinds of applications of satellites uh, like GPS, everybody is familiar. And the, everybody has in their cars now on the cell phones, uh, communications through space, direct TV, all the, and the national security applications. All these things are coming from space technology. And as the development in the science and engineering uh, advanced to such a sophisticated degree, as a result, you cannot be a specialist in everything. So you cannot uh, deal with, say, fluids and orbital mechanics at the same time. It's just on a deep level. On a superficial level, you can, but as a manager, but uh, not on a deep level as a practicing engineer. So because of that, astronautical engineering focuses on what we do in space, on designing, building, developing space vehicles, robotic spacecraft, satellites and on numerous applications in space so it's a very large area in itself orbital mechanics propulsion communications control all kind of wonderful things that you see on tv anyone else want to jump in um i will say some things about the differences in the undergraduate curriculum um because one way of thinking of of uh of aerospace or astronautical engineering is their mechanical engineering, but with emphasis on vehicles. In the case of aeronautical engineering, uh, it is, as Professor Grutman said, on flying vehicles, vehicles that are in the atmosphere and their they come their lift comes from from aerodynamic forces. In uh, in astronautics, we we worry about uh, about vehicles which are either outside the atmosphere for their entire lifetimes or else vehicles such as rocket launches which go through the atmosphere on their way out so so if you're in if you're in aeronautics then then the air is kind of what you live for for us the air is just kind of a nuisance it gets in the way on our way to space so we share a lot of the courses though with with mechanical and with with aerospace so for example statics dynamics strength of materials laboratory courses computer aided design all those courses are taken by mechanical, by aerospace, and by astronautics. Um, and in addition, uh, well, I know some of you will have questions about this too. There are there are a number of extracurricular student activities, which uh, one a couple that we do are rocket propulsion lab and liquid propulsion lab. Uh, a, a big one that's that's operated by AME is Design Build Fly, which is aircraft. They also do race cars. There are many student groups that are where uh, people from all across engineering participate. They're not restricted to any one, um, any one major. And so, and furthermore, if you're a major, if you're a member of the astro major, you will you will have friends all across the school of engineering, and you will take a lot of classes with aero and mechanical students as well. But the courses in your senior year will uh, will lean heavily toward purely astronautics. <laughs> Pardon me. You might take an aeronautics course like flight mechanics as a technical elective, but more likely you'll take courses in the in the astronautics area, and eventually you'll take a capstone design course, not in aircraft design like in like in aerospace they would, but you'll take a course in space mission design from Professor Barnhart. 
And there are another number of other courses in your junior and senior year that are astronautic specific. Our major is smaller than the other two. So we have roughly 30 astro students who come in every year as freshmen, uh, which is about half of aerospace. And mechanical is even twice as big as that. So it's kind of 60 aerospace and 120 mechanicals, give or take. So we're, a, a, I don't want to say a niche major, but we're definitely smaller and we tend to know all, all of our students. You know, I was going to ask about curriculum, so I'm glad you got there. Uh, why don't we talk about how students start and maybe give a little more detail related to that intro class that you mentioned before. If students are coming into the major, what would happen in that first class? And then maybe others can jump in with laying out what would, what would happen in their specific classes as, as they run into you throughout the curriculum. Okay, so I'll start talking about Astro 101 then, which is the, the course that's taught fall semester your first year. And it's an introduction... Actually, I think of it as two kinds of introduction. One, it's to astronautics, which means to what space is all about, what's different about space, uh, but also what is engineering, because it's your first engineering course. So in addition to space-specific topics, um, how the atmosphere decreases and falls off to almost nothing as you get into orbit, it's mainly oxygen atoms. We have, we have an influx of sunlight and trapped particles, solar wind, uh, how it is that we get to orbit, stay to orbit, how rocket vehicles work. There are a whole bunch of space-specific topics that we cover, but also we cover more general engineering topics, such as uh, such as control, such as modeling, mathematical modeling of systems, um, such as as uh, we actually we actually do a little bit of artificial intelligence. It's considered that there are some topics that all engineers should know, uh, regardless of whether uh, it's considered that that. Uh, all engineers should know how to do um, some kind of programming in, in a language like MATLAB or Python. In addition, uh, students should all know, should have uh, neural networks and artificial intelligence as part of their bag of tricks. These things are, are not restricted to computer science. So I try to give a kind of a flavor of what it is to, to, have, to be able to solve technical problems uh, and they're not just simple mathematical problems. They may be much more open-ended. We may, uh, and I assign a couple of projects. One year we we figured out how to uh, how to land a booster. One year we figured out how to aim a spacecraft to the moon so that it would swing around and and go on the far side and then end up landing on the sea of tranquility. Um, last year we did a thing where starting from simulated uh, asteroid observations, we figured out what an unknown asteroid was going to do. Of course, I set it up so that it was going to hit the Earth. So we set up a, an, a rocket uh, mission to impact the asteroid and deflect it away from Earth. And this was partly technical, partly mathematical, but it illustrates the kind of things that you have to do in the real world. Well, I hope we don't have to do that last one. Unless you're in a Hollywood movie, of course, right? Of course. Other classes you all like to talk about? Dave, do you want to talk about that senior class that you mentioned before? Maybe talk about how students get to that. We talked about the beginning. Where does it end yeah. up? Yeah, no, that's a good point. That's a the the, the culmination of of uh, what you've learned or what you will learn in the undergraduate is meant to come at an apex at the the capstone design course, which is done at the uh, the very last semester, theoretically uh, in your senior year, and and that course, in all honesty, uh, is meant to. Uh, take elements from every single of the skill sets that you learned along the way in your undergraduate curriculum. So um, as an example, um, typically uh, the class is broken into sort of two areas. One is you, you have to design the, the thing that's going to go up, which is a spacecraft or a satellite. And therefore you're calling upon uh, curriculum that you're going to get taught. But what is a telemetry system? What is an attitude control system? Uh, what what kind of sensors go on board a particular satellite? So you put all that together, but then in addition, what happens at the last uh, class is you put it in the context of a mission. So a particular activity, very similar to sort of how uh, Professor Irwin starts out in the 101 class, he gives you a problem and then you try to solve that. Same thing happens in the mission design class at the end is that basically we operate it like we put on an RFP, a request for proposal, um, you need to go and develop a business uh, to remediate debris around the earth. And you have a certain number of constraints that you have to do that with. 
So not only do you, do you use your technical skills, but you also get introduced to sort of the, the non-technical skills associated with um, business attributes, costs that you have to worry about. Um, so the last, the, the course really is about one foot in the university and one foot out. And that's the intention. And if I recall correctly, one of those senior design projects is uh, the video that's behind you now, correct? That was an actual project that was made? No, no, this was this came from something else that I used to amuse myself mainly on these Zoom calls, as well as others that might see it. So, no. <laughs> that that's this is aspirational. Absolutely. In the astronauts department, we are gonna build what's behind us. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Cool. One day. One, One day. day. <laughs> Professor Groman, I know you wanted to talk about progressive degree, but maybe that might be a nice uh, segue into the, the undergraduate curriculum and the possibilities of obtaining a bachelor's and a master's in reduced time through the progressive degree program. So um, many years ago, 20, 30, 40 years ago, an engineer could uh, have a bachelor of science degree and have a rewarding technical career in the industry until retirement. And uh, I'm not talking about uh, management, uh, getting MBA on the way and all that for top level managers, but for the technical specialists. Today, the situation changed. The master's degree is uh, known what is called as a terminal degree. That means uh, you one during your work, during your career, you would need to get a master's degree, part-time, full-time, just where there are very different ways. So uh, our progressive degree program, also known as four plus one, allows our undergraduate students start planning their coursework in such a way as to add only one extra year, the fifth year of the studies in order to get in addition to bachelor's degrees, also the master's degree. And uh, our master's degree in astronautics is among the largest in the country. And uh, why is it so large and so popular among practicing engineers working in the industry and also students on campus is because we're in Los Angeles, a lot of specialized topics and Los Angeles is still the center of the space industry and government space research and development centers in the United States. So we have a lot of talent top specialists working in industry and government, and the specialists want to give back to the next generation of engineers, and they teach in our program. So they're, again, top people in the trenches, and they teach in our program, and we have an unmatched selection of courses on the master's level. And uh, our uh, actually undergraduate students, seniors, also can occasionally take our, our master's classes for credit. But if you plan your work in advance, you can add one extra year only rather than one year and a half, which is needed for a regular full-time on-campus student coming to get a master's degree to get our own master's in addition to Bachelor of Science degree. It's a very popular program. A lot of undergrads uh, take advantage of that. And you can also switch majors. We have uh, many students that are uh, getting masters in astronautics who have Bachelor of Science in mechanical engineering and electrical engineering and in other majors. They get this space bug on the way and they want to go to the stars and we're here to help them to go to the stars and bring you back if you want. Fantastic. Let's switch gears a little bit and talk about the other side of academia. Of course, there's curriculum classes, but there's also research going on, and we are a research institution. Can we talk a little bit about the research that's happening either that either each of you individually are conducting or overall for the department? Well, we're uh, we're all involved in research to some degree. Our, our areas are quite different. I think uh, in terms of the most hands-on kind of experimental work, that uh, undergraduates would find the most accessible. I think probably uh, what Professor Barnhart does at the Space Engineering Research Center is uh, is uh, the most directly accessible. Um, I sometimes have undergraduates working in, in my lab, although I'm not really doing research in space related stuff right now. Uh, my, my work has more um, like uh, uh, programmable quadcopters and, and, uh, and model cars. So because of my interest in in, uh, in autonomous vehicles. 
So, but we have also two student groups uh, that were mentioned already, uh, rocket propulsion laboratory and liquid propulsion laboratory. That's uh, a lot of students spend a huge amount of time there because they're so excited. And our RPL, the Rocket Propulsion Lab, actually distinguished itself in 2019, becoming the first student group in the world that built a missile, a rocket that went beyond the so-called von Karman line. This is 100 kilometers altitude. And this is sort of a imaginary line that separates uh, atmosphere from space. So they became the first group in the world and uh, that uh, did it. And they're building every year more and more sophisticated solid propellant rockets, test them, design, build and test. And also liquid propulsion laboratory uh, is uh, engaged in the building uh, with increasing sophistication, liquid engines with regenerative cooling, 3D printed. So they're very, very sophisticated also using a kerosene type and the liquid oxygen, the combination of uh, ox propellant and propellant. So it's uh, a lot of work for our undergrads and uh, you go to the faculty members, volunteer, to uh, their research projects or you join the student groups and you can try different things during your studies because this is very important to find your own niche, the place to do something that you really enjoy because you don't want to do something from nine to five. You want it to be really excitement, your life, not like a strict uh, allocation of time and you need to try different things and to figure out what is best suits for you. Some students like maybe computer coding, others would like data analysis. Uh, again, others would like, would they make their hands dirty and drink hole, dr uh, drill holes, bend metal and produce some real hardware stuff. You can try all of this and find what is your real calling. Professor Reisman, you wanna talk about your areas? You're muted. Sure. Mm -hmm. um, yes, I'd be happy to. Uh, so really, the 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 curriculum I came up with when I first joined uh, this department, which hard to believe is now over five years ago, um, was uh, the way I came about it was was thinking about my time when I was director of operations at SpaceX, and when we would hire people to to work at the time we were getting ready to. We were designing and developing the the crew drag <clears throat> vehicle that we're now using to send NASA astronauts up to the space station, and um, at the time, you know, if we needed somebody to do a stress analysis, that was no problem. We could hire somebody straight out of undergraduate college, and they could set up a finite element model, and no problem. If we needed somebody to to write code for flight software, that we can get somebody straight out of computer science, and they could write C plus plus code, and that was no problem either. But if we needed somebody to make a spacesuit, you know, it was kind of hard to find anybody coming out of college who knew how to do that or like scrub CO2 out of the atmosphere or do operations in space. So those were the, those were the gaps that we had to we had to train everybody at SpaceX on the job. And and, it, and there was quite a bit of spooling up time before they can really contribute, whereas in all these other fields uh, they could contribute on day one. So I sat down and I made a list of all those things. And that's why I, I came up with the different topics that I teach. So now I, I have three graduate level courses I teach. One is an intro to human space flight. And also go, that also goes into, it uh, takes a deep dive into operations. And then I have two specialty courses. One is human factors engineering. And the other is um, uh, life support systems, hazards of the space environment and space suits. So that covers all those topics. And um, then I also, I do an undergraduate version of the intro course. So as an undergraduate coming into ASTE, uh, you can certainly take that class as an elective when you get uh, to the end of your undergraduate uh, curriculum. But also as, as Professor Grumman was talking about through the PDP program, or even just with special permission, you could take those other three uh, graduate courses as electives as well as, a, as an undergrad. So there would be an opportunity for you to to, to, to take some of those courses um, beyond even just the, the basic intro. Great, thank well, you. Uh, yeah. Paul, if I, if I could add, uh, since uh, Professor 
Riesman mentioned uh, industry and uh, work. So where would our graduates go after graduation? It's so great because it's like it's like that was going to be my next question. So that's fantastic. <laughs> it's like you're reading my mind. Uh, so, so this is one of the things that in Astronautics we teach the students. <laughs> uh, and um, until 1990s, uh, space was primarily government programs. In the United States, it uh, was the largest in the world government programs, and they remain uh, roughly on the same level. But since those days, commercial space b b grew fantastically. So today, commercial space like a four times larger worldwide than the government space. Still, a lot of interesting jobs are in government. In the United States, it's roughly the civilian program at NASA, space exploration, space vehicles, rockets, and all that. Then there is a military space supporting Department of Defense. And then there's the third program that sometimes overlooked about the same size deals with the reconnaissance satellites, collecting information from space. So this is about $80 billion per year programs in the government. They uh, remain very stable, a lot of very interesting uh, jobs, uh, high technology. And then commercial space is now two, three, four, five times larger than that. So a lot of entrepreneurial activities, so a lot of uh, legacy companies, big companies, Boeing's, Lockheed's, Raytheon's are there. And also a lot of smaller companies that are coming with a very innovative solution. So it's a huge number of opportunities. And also we have some of our graduates actually were Entrepreneur, entrepreneurs that uh, succeeded in the space area. There's a couple of companies that were uh, either built by our graduates or by students who came to our program, got a degree, and then uh, improved their companies that they're working in. Any others you all would like to mention as far as where you, you know, oh, since oh, I, I, I neglected to mention that the other uh, motivation for my coming up with these courses that I've been teaching in human space flight is not only the, the demand, but also um, the fact that there are opportunities now. Uh, so the great thing is that the students that take my human space flight courses can actually go out and get a job doing these things. So if I would have taken any of my courses when I was an undergrad or even a grad student, uh, they would have been fun and be great to learn about human factors and everything, but uh, couldn't actually get a job, you know, doing it because we had the space shuttle and, you know, the space station and that was kind of it. Uh, the great thing is now that students that take the, the study of these topics, uh, you know, there, there are a lot of companies out there building human, human spacecraft. So you have not only the, the, you know, the big companies like Lockheed making Orion and Boeing working on the SLS rocket, but also you have, the, as as Professor Grubman was mentioning, you have SpaceX uh, with Falcon 9 and Dragon. You have Blue Origin working on the orbital reef. You've got uh, Sierra, Sierra Space working on Dream Chaser. You've got um, Axiom and Vast working on their space stations. There's all these companies out there. And, and I now, since I've been doing this for a while, I now have students at all those companies. So graduates of, of my courses are now working at SpaceX and Blue Origin and Vast and and Axiom, and they're all working on spacesuits and working on space stations. And it's really cool that they're actually out there doing that, you know, that that uh, that there's actually a need for for this, this because because uh, as, as uh, Professor Grumman mentioned, this this commercial space industry is really taking off, no pun intended. So and SpaceX is the next door to you see, and they, since their beginning in the early 2000s, they began to hire our grads undergrads and with a bachelor's master's degree and now tons of our grads are working there so there's a usc astronautics mafia inside so you guys may benefit a lot of our students get internships spacex is one of the most popular destinations and again professor Eastman probably can just talk more about that but again it's a lot of opportunities in la for internships for our students during the summers and some of the even start working during the semester so the company's part-time this is great thank you and i want to give our audience <clears throat> a chance to start getting their questions ready and so i am turning on the q a feature so at the bottom of the zoom window there's a q a button you can tap that 
start typing in your questions, folks, and start having at it. Just start letting them flow and then upvote the ones that you like to get up to the top. I'm going to ask one more question while you're all doing that. So we'll let them go. And so faculty, you could still just stay with me, but let's let the, everyone, our guests get their questions in, and then we'll go to those questions right after this one. My last question, I'm going to start with Professor Reisman, but I'd love everybody to jump in if they have their thoughts on this. But Professor Reisman, you've been in space. You've done two spacewalks, if I remember correctly. You have worked in industry and in designing these kind of capsules. You're now in academia doing the research and the curriculum related to space. What are you excited for for the future of this type of industry, this type of discipline? What's going to happen in the future? Where do you, where do you see it going? Well, Paul, I've done three spacewalks, not two. Three, excuse me. I'm so sorry. <laughs> I, 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 so I, I said I might have gotten this wrong. <laughs> not, you know, not, not that I'm counting or anything. <laughs> Uh, <clears throat> yeah, but, uh, anyway, uh, yeah, no, I'm, I'm, so look, we're, we're really just in the very beginning of this whole new era. I mean, I, I'm, uh, I, I was very fortunate in the sense that I got to be a part of the space shuttle and ISS, uh, timeframe and got to fly in space and do not two, but three spacewalks. And, uh, that's fantastic. You know, I, I consider myself unbelievably lucky. But in a way, I'm unlucky because, you know, I came along too late for Apollo, which was the first giant uh, leap, if you will, uh, to borrow a phrase, uh, in, in human spaceflight. But too soon to to um, really fully participate in, in this next giant leap, which is what's happening right now. And so what we're going to see in the future with these new commercial space stations, with the Artemis program uh, gearing up to send Americans back to the moon, uh, and with, you know, Starship coming along, if that thing uh, actually uh, comes to fruition and works as advertised, we're going to see massive revolutions in, in human spaceflight uh, that will make Apollo uh, kind of almost in kind of quaint. I mean, I'm, the, the next 10, 20 years are going to be, have the potential anyway to be truly uh, remarkable. And uh, it's a great time to be starting a career in astronautical engineering. I can't, really can't think of a better time, even including the Apollo days. Any other thoughts on the future? Yeah, the, the big one that I would sort of step into is following that. We want humans in the space, uh, most assuredly, but it also, in some sense, it's the thing behind me. It's the the infrastructure and how do we build those things in space, um, both uh, autonomously, so a lot of space robotics, um, new types of uh, material technology, new types of uh, printing that actually occurs in space. All of that is literally happening as we speak. Um, the the next sort of thing that people talk about that that is that, that is with all these companies is servicing. The idea that once you send something up there, now you can go do something to it. For fifty years, we've never been able to do that. Didn't have the technology, didn't have the capability, didn't have the low launch cost, which we now have. And that's it's here now, literally. And you guys are are entering the arena where you're going to be the pioneers that are going to make that all happen. Great. So we will jump into the audience Q&A now. One thing I neglected to mention, uh, this, uh, this Q&A is not for anything related to admission or the application process. So we're going to automatically dismiss those questions if they rise to the top. If you have any questions related to admission or the application process, we have plenty of in-person and other virtual events. As a matter of fact, there's a virtual event tomorrow for admission if you want to do that. We will talk nothing about admission in the application process. My colleague Lisa, who is in the background, will put in a link in the chat so you can register for that in addition to other academic faculty sessions or watch recordings recordings of ones that have already happened. So let's dive into our questions. And again, as a reminder, keep going in and upvoting. So find things at the bottom that you see you want to pull to the top, go ahead and do that because I think after a while people forget. And so I'm going to continue to remind you as you go. So first question to the faculty is from Greer. Greer wins the, the most popular question for today. Greer, congratulations. You get um, a prize of just feeling great about yourself today. So Greer, can you talk more about the USC Rocket Propulsion Laboratory and how to get involved? Um, I'll take that one because I'm the faculty mentor for it, and uh, it's actually really easy to get involved. The if you uh, if you show up to the first meeting, which is on the first Friday of the month uh, of the semester, I'm sorry. If uh, and in fact, if uh, the RPL as well as other student groups make visits to all the introductory courses. In the, in the first couple of weeks of the semester to try to attract new members. And of course, one of the things they let them do is, is tell everybody how they can actually join. The 
Uh, some student groups actually have a kind of an application process. RPL doesn't. You can just show up and be part of it and you can pick your own level. Some people just come every once in a while as kind of a social thing and they just help out as needed. At the other extreme, you have people who are practically there all the time and they, they may spend 20, 30, 40, 50 hours a week in lab, uh, but that's that's only a few people who are kind of the core leadership. But you can, again, you can pick really your own level. And if uh, there are a lot of people who joined as freshmen and worked their way up, and by the time they're juniors, they're, uh, they're team leads and and eventually maybe lab leads even. So uh, so bottom line, it's, it's very easy to join. And I can add that uh, you, please go to the website uscrpl.com and usclpl.com and uh, you will get a lot of information how to get involved and you volunteer. And also we noticed that having participation in RPL and LPL on their resume is a tremendous attractive point getting jobs in the industry because in engineering very complex programs and the engineers are supposed to work as teams in the classes it's uh, primarily individual work with the homework and everything else but here in rpl and lpl they work as the teams getting experience and this is a tremendously attractive points on the resumes for industry great not just, not just sorry paul uh, not just that it's teams it's that it's actual real world problems with with real circuits and metal and all the things that go into a rocket. Uh, so in in industry these days, yes, they're interested in in what classes you took, and it's good that you have GPA up in the up in the B range, somewhere in the threes, but but they care much more about what you did. So if you go to a job interview, whether it's for an internship or a permanent job after you graduate, you should be prepared to show them what you actually did. And that's what that's what they're going to be interested in. And Rocket Lab and the other student groups really prepare you for that in a way that as good as our classwork might be, it won't prepare you the way a, a true hands-on experience will. Great. Thank you very much. Our next question, and to be technical in case anyone's keeping score, Greer may have had the most popular question at the beginning, but Grayson got more upvotes. And so Grayson, I guess you win now? Uh, what does the day-to-day -day look like for someone in the astronautics department? Activities, common projects, et cetera? Kind of a hard question because there's probably not one exact day. Uh, and it's kind of a lot of the stuff we already talked about, but I'm curious if you guys have had any other thoughts on this. Well, I'll, I'll say one thing about college in general, that um, you're not typically taking courses all day long. There's usually holes in your schedule and you have some some freedom in how your schedule is organized. For some people, uh, they they make it a big priority to make at least one day per per week when they don't have any classes. That's actually harder in engineering than it is in say business, but but some people do it, um, people who like to surf and so on. But actually uh, it isn't just for, for recreation. It might be, for example, that if somebody worked with Professor Barnhart out at Space Engineering Research Center, they might work to get their to get every Friday free, for example, so that they can go and, and work there all day. So there's different reasons to organize your schedule. But a more ordinary schedule, you might have uh, you might have big sections of your mornings free, or just it really depends on how your courses go. And so you might uh you might hang out with people on campus. There's places you can study. Actually, for that matter, if people who are in the rocket lab, a lot of times if you go by during the day, you'll find people working on my homework or or uh or some something that people happen to be happen to need to do together so uh there's there is time for for you to do uh out activities outside of engineering and i'll give a very short pitch for for usc as being a not just a good engineering school but a, a good school in general for for lectures musical events uh outside activities there's uh, if you if you uh, if you go and just look to see who's on campus presenting what the events are that you can go do, it, it's it's pretty mind boggling. Great, thank you so much. Uh, let's go to Shant's question. Shant is asking, what select talents, traits, or skills would you recommend an incoming first year student have in order to succeed in the program?
I can kick it off. Um, oftentimes, a lot of our prospective engineering students, regardless of disciplines, believe that there is a perfect combination of things that make a successful person down the road. And they think that those things are specific to industry or disciplines. And usually that's, we all know that that's not the case. Uh, from an admission perspective, we need to see that you've done well in your coursework, that you've done uh, rigorous courses in math and science. Uh, we need to see at least one year of success in calculus. Uh, that's what's going to be important. But outside of that, there's lots of different traits, talents, and skills that come together because we're trying to build a class, regardless of discipline, of individual people with different individual talents, traits, and skills to come together to create a team that has that you know, sum is greater than the, the, what is that? The whole is greater than the sum of its parts situation. It's building that diverse group of unique people to come together. So I would say it's a desire. It's a desire and interest in the things that these gentlemen have been talking about. If you like what they've been talking about, that sounds like something you want to do. That's probably the most important thing because outside of that, it's going to be hard. And they talk about this with a passion, but it doesn't mean that it's easy for them and they don't expect it to be easy on anyone as well. So I would say a desire, the background that you have in high school is what we're looking for. They're going to teach you the rest moving on and, and a determination to get through those hard points usually is supported by that desire and that love for the, for the things that we're talking about. Anything else you all would like to add? Didn't mean to take the question from you. Let's move on. Uh, Julian is asking a question in general, how accessible are research opportunities? So I can, I, I can speak from the, the, the research center that we put together. Um, we actually do projects that go from fundamental research in a number of different specific areas, um, uh, robotic elements for space, uh, RPO vision systems, um, at, as uh, as Dr. Irwin indicated, one of the challenges in in your undergraduate uh, uh, program is time. T time is one of those things that you've got to be able to manage. From the research standpoint, um, we have a number of opportunities that are available. The challenge it becomes: Are you able to provide the time to support it? Um, not only is the RPL and the LPL available; they're on campus. Those are are are, are always available. Uh, but the activities out of the Space Engineering Research Center, um, I have specific projects that come in and they have a specific schedule. We have task activities. Typically, they're run by graduate students or PhDs. So you would be actually working with or under those individuals. Um, but in general, we have we have a reasonably large uh, numbers of opportunities of projects that undergraduates could get involved with, typically in their junior to senior kind of a year. All right. Uh, next is another question. Would you say that astronautical engineering is a good major for students hoping to become an astronaut one day? Professor Reisman, you want to jump in on this one? I know that this is a kind of a complex answer. I was kind of hoping that uh, Dave would take this question, but okay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, is it a good uh, a good major for if you want to be an astronaut someday? Well, it's definitely a better major than like medieval history i suppose <laughs> uh if you want to be an astronaut no no it, 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 the answer is yes it, it it is it's a it's a good but i have to caveat that by saying that there's no one way to become an astronaut you know if you look at the people that nasa is selecting uh they have a wide variety of backgrounds the, the single biggest group of applicants and the single if you the, the largest percentage probably if you went through all the astronauts uh on the current roster would be general engineering. Uh, that's that's our biggest group that we select from uh, at NASA and uh, and probably is the biggest percentage of the overall population. But um, but there's also plenty of other ways to do it. We, you can be a physician, you could be, you can go into military and, and, and be military operations, test pilots, uh, army helicopter pilots, Navy SEALs. We even have a, we had a, on my first flight, I flew with a, one of my crewmates was a veterinarian. So you, you could, you could be a variety of things. Uh, and get there. Uh, but we certainly have a lot of people in our department that are interested in flying in space themselves someday. It's a question I get over and over. In fact, I get the question so much from our students that I got tired of, of saying the same thing over and over as far as advice goes. So I made a video. So you can do this right now if you want to uh, start thinking about this. Uh, you can go to my YouTube channel, just go to YouTube and search on my name and you'll find a video I, I, I made during the pandemic. I just had a Zoom class with a high school student, one of our students here at uh, ASTE, and then a JPL senior scientist. So I wanted people from all different 
points in their career trajectory to get different perspectives. And we talked for about an hour and I gave them all the advice I could think of on how to become an astronaut and I, I recorded it and now it's on, you can just go watch it. So you can start there. And then if you come to USC, I'm happy to talk to you more about it and wish you the best of luck. I, it's a great, it's a great career. I highly recommend it. <laughs> Very cool. Thank you. Uh, I would also say that, uh, you know, getting into the space industry does not necessarily intrinsically tied to a major in astronautical engineering either, because these types of complex systems involve lots of different types of engineering. So just think about the thing that you want to do the most. Although I'm sure in this particular conversation, astronautical engineering is the best major. And I'm sure that we can definitely uh, confirm that with our with our panelists here today. Uh, next question from Bailey. Is it a good idea to match up an in international relations and astronautical engineering if I want to work on space policy after college? So, so I'll take that one out. So that's a fascinating question. And, and the reason I'll suggest that is that I actually um, was able to give a presentation to what I'll call a serious astro geek um, conference years ago. And that was the exact topic was not necessarily policy, but as a, as a technical individual, when you get an engineering degree, you get passionate about the things you're creating, <clears throat> but sometimes you have to get approval to go use it. That then lends itself to this notion of policy or regulatory or whatever. And so having the skill set to communicate to folks that are not as passionate or that don't have the, you know, the technical depth that you might have is actually really important. Um, at, at the, uh, at the CERC, we, we, we have what's called Ad Astro Fellows. And one of the first Ad Astro Fellows that I brought in was Dr. Nikita Chu, who is nothing to do with uh, technical, but she's all about space policy. And what she lacked was the technical credibility regimen. So, so I think it's it's a fascinating question uh, to merge those two things together. I can add uh, two points uh, that uh, I'm a little bit started to get involved with the people on the space policy side and on space history also. And my observation is that a lot of folks working in these areas, they have no clue what they're talking about technically. And this is a highly technical field. So you have to have a basic understanding of that. So having this dual track in your background will certainly put you in a special category among the most knowledgeable people. You At least you would understand the technical issues because again, this is something that's uh, overlooked by majority of the people in these soft areas. From a, a strictly tactical perspective, I would uh, add that uh, you want to start with the major in astronautical engineering. This is where you want to start your process. This is where you want to start the application process. This is where you want to start your degree program. And then decide if you want to add on international relations later or something else that might be interesting. And that was likely going to be done with a minor in the undergraduate program. And then should you pursue additional graduate work, you might want to pull in other things down the road. So don't think that everything has to happen in the undergraduate years, but to, to pull this all together, that core technical degree, the beginning of the bachelor's degree in astronautical engineering is, is probably your best bet to get started. And I can say that as a rocket engineer, rocket scientist, you can later do international relations, but not the other way around. It's yes. practically impossible. Exactly. Uh, next question uh, I'll take. Uh, Jacob is asking what study broad opportunities do, uh, I think he means astronautical engineering, uh, students typically take advantage of any uh, study abroad opportunities are not restricted to one particular major. And so astronautical engineers, just like any other engineering student have all the opportunities at the university to engage in study abroad programs, semester long programs, summer programs, sometimes there are, there's, there are break programs, May semester programs, August fall lead programs. It's all across the board. There's a lot of different opportunities. There's exchange programs that exist and they're all across the world. So there's a lot of opportunities here. The Viterbi School wants students to engage in study abroad opportunities should you wish to do so. So it's completely up to you and how you want to make that happen. We create a lot of different programs because every student can work it in in a different way. And that's kind of how we want to help you figure those things out. Uh, Marco is asking, do you advise or see co-majors or a minor in other engineering specialties like a major in astro and a minor in aero? Marco, this is, so I'll let you guys jump in on this, but I have some opinions on this. Um, I will say that the, there isn't actually that much value to that. Of the, there's too much overlap between the majors. If, if uh, typically a major and a minor are in, are in somewhat separated areas, 
they might still both be technical. For example, we've had majors in astronautical engineering with minors in mathematics, which makes really a lot of sense. Um, and uh, and sometimes they're non-technical. We've had we've had minors in political science. Um, and but a a major and a minor in two such closely allied majors doesn't doesn't make very much sense. Yeah, and, and honestly, this is actually related to the next question that Brian is asking, saying, you know, would would what would be recommended for students who are not 100% sure? And Marco, I think that's where this question is coming from, because oftentimes a lot of our students will say like, oh, can I just do both? And that's not a reason to do both, but specifically when they are so closely aligned as Dr. Erwin was, was explaining. At this point, there's no expectation that you have it all figured out or that you understand exactly what you're doing and the ideas of aero astro and even mechanical the fact that they are so intertwined and have somewhat of the same core discipline at this point pick the thing that sounds the most interesting to you right moving parts moving things things in space those are the simple ways to think about it and if you're thinking about it start in one if you realize that it's not right for you you can move to the other with no penalty and students are moving between these three disciplines rather frequently so i wouldn't worry too much about that and at the end of the day also and I think that Professor Reisman can 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 support this. Is that as you get out, those same three people with mechanical, aero, and astro are likely having some of the same jobs when they get out because the ideas of all working together with that same core discipline. So it's much more about what sounds cool to you, which sounds oversimplified. But what sounds cool to you? Start there. We'll figure it out as you go. And as Professor Irwin mentioned, if you have other interests, let's make them as disparate or interesting as possible. Not necessarily the same. Um, next question. Uh, in general, when will astronautical engineering students get internships or do research at USC? And I think ultimately that is really up to you all because students do that as early as their first semester as far as getting research. Internships typically the summer after their first year is the first time that they can do it. But every student is individual and different depending on their level of engagement and opportunities with, with industry. Any other thoughts on that? It is, uh, it is easier to get internships at the major space corporations or at J NASA JPL, for example, after the second year, after the sophomore year. It sometimes happens after the freshman year. Um, and uh, I have written recommendation letters for students who have, got, who have, uh, as a result of mine and other people's letters and their very good records, have, got, have gotten, after the freshman year, internships at places like Blue Origin and SpaceX. But but it's that's kind of the exception. It's, it's more common to do it after the sophomore year. Research, you can do really pretty much any time. And there's this perception that, that research is some kind of magic thing that you need to be some super smart, advanced person. But the thing is, everybody who does research has a whole bunch of problems that they don't have time to work on. And if somebody comes along and expresses an interest, there's almost always some overlap where you can say, uh, gee, I, I could work on that. And, oh, that'd be great. And pretty soon, you know, a lot of times somebody will get involved in research and within a year, they're one of the trusted members of the lab and maybe have their names on research papers, which is extraordinarily valuable, particularly if they want to be go to graduate school later on. Uh, having Being a co-author and getting a really good recommendation from a research supervisor is about the best thing besides good grades that you can have if you want to go to graduate school. In our closing few minutes, I'm going to hand this over to you all faculty uh, to see if there's any closing thoughts that you would like to share with our audience, or if there's any specific question that you see buried in the Q&A that you really, really want to talk about. So this is your, your chance that I'm not directing it and handing it over to you. I, I don't know, take it about the only thing I'd recommend there was a question about sort of what skills are out there and I think you answered the the question quite quite good Paul about what to expect to come in for but my recommendation is um, if you're able to do some hands-on work within your high school anything um, uh, dealing with Arduinos or Raspberry Pis any kind of articulations uh, with your hands soldering anything like that um, it, it's not required but it, what it does is it gives you a feel for taking the engineering disciplines, which will be very deep when you get it, and then translating that into sort of hardware practicality. So, so it's a useful exercise. Um, I would like to address one question that's in the, in the Q&A about international students. And um, it's a sensitive topic, obviously, but I have to say that, the, that, at, that if you're an international student, it might not be the best major for you because to work in the US space industry, 
you have to be either be a permanent resident or a citizen or have at least a pathway to citizenship. Um, now, it might be if you're from a company, a country that has a substantial space program, such as India, for example, that it might still be the right thing. And you might end up working in, in ISRO, the, the space agency in India, just as an example. But um, so, but in general, uh, astronautics is in the United States is pretty much a U.S. citizen activity. And also to add on to that, because the question was asking about restrictions on admission. And so to clarify, there are no restrictions on admission, nothing to worry about there. But uh, Professor Irwin's comments are correct when it comes to industry and employment. And internships uh, as well. There's a yes. very few, few internships. But I usually tell students in uh, such cases that they are not the first one in this situation and not the last one. A lot of students still coming. It's more difficult than for American U.S. nationals to uh, get these opportunities, internships, and jobs, but it's still possible. All right, but folks. Mm -hmm. Well, with that, I want to thank all of our audience for joining us today and spending the hour with us talking about astronautical engineering. If you have any other questions beyond today's event, please come check out one of our admission events that are happening on our website. Don't miss the deadline that's coming up very soon. Check our website, viterbiadmission.usc.edu for all of the recent deadlines to make sure that you get your application in for first year admission correctly. And most importantly, I'd like to thank our panelists, Professor Gruntman, Professor Reisman, Professor Irwin, and Professor Barnhart. And with my favorite Zoom background, <laughs> right when I'm trying to close it out cleanly, you got me back at the back end. <laughs> But yeah, leave, it on a, uh, leave it on an up note, right? That's what it was. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> leave it on an up note. All right, everybody. Thank you so much. Have a great weekend. We'll see you later. Bye-bye.